this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and once again, we're recording at Nutmeg with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is an actor, screen and television writer, Emmy and Grammy winning performer, and one of the most popular, admired, and prolific stand-up comedians of his generation. As an actor, you've seen him in hit TV shows like The King of Queens, The Simpsons, V, Archer, Justified, uh, Mystery Science Theater, uh, 3000, <laughs> the Mystery Science Theater, 3000. <laughs> it's Mystery Science it's Theater. Be one of those shows. 3000. <laughs> <laughs> the Return Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Goldbergs, and AP Bio. You also know him from movies such as Magnolia, Zoolander, Blade, Play Trinity, Play Trinity, <laughs> Trinity, Trinity, Play Trinity, Trinity from Play Trinity, <laughs> Big Big Fan, The Informant, Young Adult, and of course the brilliant Chef Remy in Pixar's Oscar-winning comedy. Ratatouille. 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 The, the, literally, Rat- the one word you actually should be saying like Jerry Lewis and you, you struggle Rat- to do that. Ratatouille. <laughs> ramen. <laughs> ramen noodle. Uh, ramen shival. He, uh, he's also... Uh, he's also a film scholar. Huh? Yes. And the author of the New York Times bestsellers. Zombie Spaceship Wasteland, Silver Screen Fiend, and his new crime book, on which he completed the work of his late wife, Michelle McNamara. Uh, I'll be gone in the dark. I, I didn't write that one. I just, I got it finished. Yes. Okay. Oh my God. Okay, don't my interrupt My new crime me. book. Oh, sorry about yes, that. Yes, stop it. <laughs> you know, I'm doing a very professional job. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> oh, great jumping, pacing. And you're interrupting me. One, so it's I'll Be Gone in the Dark, One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer. Welcome to the show, a sought-after comedian, actor, and writer who somehow finds time to listen to this podcast. <laughs> And a man God who help him. actually <laughs> fantasizes about seeing a movie called Billy Jack versus Blackula. <laughs> <laughs> you you all know him from science fiction three thousand. <laughs> And Rasaguli. <laughs> Rasalgo. 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 <laughs> Our oh, pal Patton Oswald. Oh, Gilbert and Frank, thank you so much. Pat, <laughs> so happy to be here. You are here. I am finally. I'm actually here. Finally. Three and a half years uh, into I- the show. I could have done this way earlier. I hate calling into shows. Oh, yeah. I will hold out till I can be there live. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, it's so much more fun this way. And you you got a lot going on. This has been one of the most surreal. Day. It, it is so strange how my, my, my late wife's book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, uh, which uh, this more, you know, she was about this serial killer that she was trying to solve this case, worked six years on it, and did not uh, live to see it completed. But this morning I woke up, there were pings on the cell phone and all these news alerts. They caught the guy. He's in jail. The Golden State Killer was caught and is now in prison. Incredible. Yeah, and I, that's how I et- began the day, and I'm ending it with Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> so it could not be 
This nope. is going to be one of the weirder days nope. of my life. No more surreal Begin than that. Begin the no. day with a serial killer <laughs> and end with Gilbert Gottfried. What more can you ask well, for? Really? I mean, that's, that's, that is seize the day, isn't it? <laughs> it? That's living your best life. You just talk a little bit about about this the, the book and what happened. and I mean, because this is such... Yeah, she was a uh, a true crime writer and investigative journalist, but what she would do is she was kind of perfecting this new sort of uh, method of where she would use a lot of online resources and searching because everything's being digitized now. So there's stuff that normally would be hidden in police files that was – she was suddenly using Google Maps and uh, uh, DNA searches and, and familial DNA and – and, and geographic profiling to figure out th- – th- this guy was the worst uncaught serial killer in California history. And one of the reasons he wasn't caught, and this is going to sound very creepy, was they didn't give him a good name. He started – he was called Eron's. Eron's was – in the 70s, he started in Sacramento, East Area Rapist. Then he stopped for a while, shows up down in Southern California – as the original Night Stalker. They didn't know that these two guys were the same guy for years. DNA comes along in the 90s. You realize, oh, it's the same guy. They called him Eron's. It takes you 10 minutes to explain what that means. Of course. And it doesn't catch on. So she, and, and when she came up with Golden State Killer, a lot of these cops were like, yeah, that actually is helpful because, you know, he didn't have a name that landed like Zodiac or Night stock marketing. You know. so, it is marketing. Yeah, yeah. In, in a case like that, <laughs> it, it's true. It's advertising. It is truly advertising. You cannot keep people's attention unless you give them a cool name. Like, like, uh, Son of Sam. Son of Sam. Great name. Yeah. And I'm not saying that like, oh, yay, he's killing people. But if you want to catch him, take a deep breath and give them a really good name. You know, don't don't call him the the third left up. After the barn killer. Like, wait, what? And like, then you, don't let Gilbert try to pronounce don't, it. And yeah. Don't let Gilbert try to take it. <laughs> it. It's funny. Like, you sell a cereal killer like a breakfast cereal yes. or a dishwashing liquid. Mm-hmm. And give it a cool name that rings in people's heads. Did you see this coming at all? Was was this, <sighs> did this take you completely by storm? I, I thought it would be, it was weird because the night before I, I was in Chicago doing a book event with the journalist who helped finish the book and Michelle's researcher, and we ended the evening. Paul Haynes and Billy Jensen. and um, yeah, Billy Jensen and Paul Haynes, yeah. and we ended the evening. Uh, this is in Chicago where my wife was from. Her whole family's there, and someone was asking, do you think he'll ever be caught? And we think, and, and I think I ended the evening by basically saying, I think time is running out for him. In my mind, thinking five, maybe ten more years down the road, with because he was so uncaught for so long, wake up that, I mean, we went to bed at, 11.30, I get started getting pings at like 4 in the morning. He's caught. He's in jail. They're going to have a press conference today. They had a huge press conference, and it was crazy. It, it's, just, it's been a very, very surreal day. And now there's like, you know, the, the, he's been convicted of two of these murders. Clearly, if, if he's if his DNA, if he's the East Area Rapist, he's also the original Night Stalker, and he's killed 12 people and raped 50. Unbelievable. And, and, and also more that we probably don't know about. And former policeman. Right. Right, right, right. Probably flashing a badge. And the reason he had to quit the police force, and this sounds like something out of a bad laugh-in sketch, but in the 70s, he was caught shoplifting oh, yes, I saw this. a hammer and dog, dog repellent. repellent. He would invade homes, and he was shoplifting a hammer and dog repellent, and then they they were going to, like, usually, and the force will usually help cover that, and he immediately quit, like, don't dig any further, I'm done, I'm out. Which should have been very suspicious. He was shopping because he doesn't didn't want any record of him buying these items, you know. So uh, again, it's just the the levels of the story can't end here. I mean, there has no, to be a no. Doc- this there is has- part two of the story has that's ended. He's I mean. in jail. There's gonna be a whole other. That, that's what I mean. There has to be so, a documentary so, or something. Or, or well, HBO is doing a multi part documentary okay. about Michelle and the writing of the book. Wonderful. But now this morning should happen. The documentary is like we, it's a different movie now. I don't know what's gonna happen. Like <laughs> now they're all trying to figure out what's this whole movie gonna be now because they're gonna do a big like like they're gonna do it like the Jinx or. Um, you know, making a murderer, a big, long series. So they already had him under two names. Under two names. In the 70s, he was the East Area Rapist, Ear, and he vanished um, because cause a guy, one of the guys he was trying to attack, and he was, die- like, he would attack couples. He would tie the, the husband up, 
Make him lie face down in the kitchen, stack plates and cups on his back, and go, if I hear any of these hit the floor while I'm in the other room with your wife, I'll kill both of you. Like, it's just this cra- – like, these cra- – he would, he would break into houses early and – leave stuff, like hide stuff, like handcuffs and ligatures that he could use later. Like he would prep the scene and um, he was held at gunpoint at one po- at one time and got away. He would vault fences. It was just, it was really, and um, uh, he, uh, and then, then he vanished for a little bit because that, the one where he almost got caught spooked him. Then he shows up, they didn't realize it was him, down in Goleta and Irvine as the original Night Stalker. And that's when he started murdering people. It's incredible. It, it's the whole thing is it's insane. And you must be numb. I mean, we've caught you on I, the day that this has just war- yeah just broken. Well, let's talk about our favorite Buddy Hackett movie. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't let, can we segue? It's a good segue. Godzilla Laker into <laughs> how do how do we get segue to Lord Love a Duck? <laughs> Lord love a duck, <laughs> which I rented. It was quite disappointing. To, well, because Horrible. they were trying. Yeah. Because God, I wanted to love. They it. had that little subplot, and it's a mad, mad, mad world. And the studio went, "There's our new comedy team." And ooh, well, George no. Axelrod was somebody to be reckoned with, but the movie's just kind of a mess. And, yeah. and, and I they, love McDowell. Yeah. And and Roddy McDowell, it's funny. It's kind of like. That movie was the original Ferris Bueller. <laughs> like, you could say this that. This obnoxious kid who's yeah. getting it over on everybody. Horrible. You hey, except you're movie. not rooting for him. You, you no. immediately hate <laughs> but him. But I wasn't rooting for Ferris Bueller. <laughs> well, and yeah. that's the first thing I Did said. Did you hear the Broderick episode where he trashed Ferris Bueller five minutes into the show? No, was sitting what? Right, was sitting yeah, right I, where you're I sitting. I think I opened with it. I told Matthew Broderick, <laughs> who's a very nice guy. <laughs> a fine actor. I was nice enough to show up here between plays. Yeah. Get a break. He had like a two-hour break. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> <guy>. <laughs> to get Kill, his ass handed to him. And, and, but him I, had a, I had to open up the interview saying, I fucking hated Ferris Bueller. <laughs> and what was his response? <laughs> yeah. Well, he was, he was very nice about very cool. it. Okay. He's a nice person. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, you know, it's weird how you look at back on some of these 80s movies where I liked Ferris Bueller when I saw it, but I can't not look at it with my eyes now and go, this is a movie about a sociopath. Yes. <laughs> He's yes. a sociopath. Yes. yes. And then there's, an, of course, you know, the other theory about Ferris Bueller, of course. Is that Ferris Bueller doesn't exist? It's all in Cameron's mind. I've it's heard a, this. It's a Fight Club situation. I've heard where this. he's imagining who he wants that to be. That would have been a good movie. And he, yeah, and he's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if he hadn't didn't exist. But it's weird. Tomorrow I fly back to L.A. and I'm going to go to the uh, premiere of a new uh, YouTube Red show called Cobra Kai. And remember the movie Karate Kid? Yes. Of course. Okay, and the and the blonde villain Johnny Lawrence yes. who is in Cobra Kai. This. TV show. It's 10 episodes. I've seen all 10 episodes, but I'm going tomorrow. It's Johnny Lawrence, his age now, in his 40s. Love it. Total loser. He's never gotten over losing the thing. And now he, and Daniel LaRusso is like this successful auto dealership guy in the Valley. And Johnny Lawrence decides to bring Cobra Kai back and try to get revenge. And it is so funny. What a smart idea. And they found the same actors. And getting back to Ferris Bueller. And getting back to Ferris Bueller. (laughs) I also thought, okay, so the principal— You felt sorry for Rooney. Yeah, Yeah. the principal's a villain (laughs) because he's got a kid who's constantly missing school. And he goes after him as a principal should do. Mm. And so the kid's missing school, lying to his parents. (laughs) Yes, yes, he's a scumbag. Right. Although it is weird now also watching the movie, knowing what you know about Jeffrey Jones and oh, seeing him yeah, obsessed with a teen boy. Poor turn of events. And, yeah, and like, of like yeah. oh, that's not going to age very well. Yeah, oh, yeah. him chasing after a boy. Yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> yeah. And it's a shame because he's such a good actor. He's, he was such, he was so great in Amadeus. Amadeus. And Beetlejuice. Oh, uh, Beetlejuice, he's yeah. great. Oh, yeah. De- uh, Devil's Advocate. Yeah, he was Devil's great Advocate. In. He was the only um, funny part of uh, Howard the Duck when he gets possessed by that demon. That, remember that the alien monster possesses him? Yeah. And all his lines are hilarious. I think you, were, you and I are the two guys that saw Howard the Duck. Oh, Did yeah. anybody see Howard the Duck? I saw it when it came out because yeah. I was like, oh, maybe this will be good. And But he has a great, she took my eggs. When they're in the diner. He went underground, the poor guy. Well, what? yeah. <laughs> what, what's he going to do? Show up at auditions? Which, and and it, it, it's one of those things. Like, I, you know, it's weird to say you feel bad for a guy. 
But I feel bad for him. Well, I, I feel bad for the fact that, you know, he did have all this talent and why couldn't he have, you know, it, it, if you're that talented and clearly that intelligent, why don't you go seek help or no? Oh, my God. Be yeah. self-aware enough to, you, you know what I mean? But I, I don't, it's tragic. And also, ultimately, the people that he messed with is awful, you know, because oh, they were wow. probably excited That's... to meet him. Like, hey, I like you in all those yeah. movies. And then, oh, boy. Oh. Creepy. You know from this show, from listening to this show, that we jump around and there's no rhyme or reason to anything. And Wait, there's no, what? There's no sequence. I no. We got we. <laughs> this has made perfect sense. We've gone See, from a, a caught serial killer to Buddy Hackett to to pedophilia, and then and now we go to. <laughs> and you know, you were talking about that movie that's made from. <laughs> I like he brings his own segues. I know. Yeah, I like that about with, him. With the villain from Karate Kid. Yeah. Yes. I always wanted to do sequels to movies. We're like Titanic. Uh-huh. I wanted to make a sequel where the Leonardo DiCaprio character does live. Mm-hmm. And and the two of them get married and then she's going, "Wait a minute." We're in a rat-infested apartment. Right, exactly. And what if who's, who's going to be cooking my meals and clean? <laughs> right. And why am I wearing these rags for? Yeah, and also that thing of like, oh, wait a minute. No, you were my slumming side snack, but I'm not, shouldn't be married. To yeah. You. This is awful. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're fun to spend a crazy night with, but a life, to, oh, no, this is a, and, and you know, he, he's going to grow up to become a temperamental alcoholic artist. Yes. You know, who's just like, oh. I, it's yeah. like, wait a minute. We, her, her choices were this very handsome, stable, violent psychopath and this fun, but also clearly someday very destructive. Like, she just had no real <laughs> options. It was good that she got away from the music guy and the, the artist, she just, she nailed him and then let him die. Like, good. Best of all yes, possible yes. worlds. <laughs> as long as we're talking about fantasy scenarios, I, before we lose this, because it's in the intro, Billy Jack versus Blackula oh. may be my favorite from your book. Yes. Your wonderful book, Silver Screen Fiend. And in the back of the book, one of the last sections of the book, is you imagine fantasy films with fantasy I, I, directors. I imagine, yeah, I imagine a month of films at this place called the New Beverly in L.A. The the owner died, Sherman Torgan, and I go, I want to program, Torgan. yeah, the great Sherman Torgan, and I want to... Um, I, I wanted to program one month of movies that, that people either dreamed of making or should have been made. Some of those are based on movies that were being developed at one point. Yeah. Like Francis Ford Coppola's Doctor, Doctor Strange. Strange. Yes, he which was doing that me. back in the early 70s, which is like, wait, what? Can you imagine? You no, had, you put, I actually You put can't. Christopher Walken in yours. Yes, yes I did. He yeah. would have been a great Doctor Strange. Young Christopher yeah. Walken? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Would have been an amazing yeah. Doctor Strange. What about Sam Peckinpah's Superman starring Steve McQueen? He was developing that at one point. Can you imagine? He was one wow. of the... They, they had him on as director for a little bit, and he wow. wanted... Wow. And, and my... my 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 dream scene in that would be, you know, someone blasts a machine gun at Superman's chest and the bullets deflect off but just go into other people and it's a bloodbath. Oh. Like all these people <laughs> die and he does and, it in slow motion. And and yes, and, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Falling back with the arms in yeah. the air. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, William Holden is Lex Luthor. Really. I don't, I don't yeah, know you, who he... You even put the dream cast together. In, in each one of these. Well, Steve McQueen is Superman. I who think else? you said, fu- you say in the oh, book, no. fuck it, Hackman yeah, will Jim, play Luther again. It's still again. Hackman, yeah, right, he was great. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Come on. <laughs> what about Billy Jack versus Blackula? Because those are two movies that have been discussed on this show. Yes. Well, I mean, the first Billy Jack movie, if you've seen it recently, is so insanely slow. Yeah. Everyone remembers the ass kicking in the park scene, yeah. and what they forget is it's literally 90 minutes of talking with three minutes of ass kicking. <laughs> It's so bad. And then, actually, the original Blackula is kind of fun. It is. You know, and, see, and I, see, now when they talk about Blackula. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for jumping in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when they talk about Blackula. Was a little schizophrenic. They, they, they always review it, and they say, and the, the great William Marshall. And I'm going, well, what? Where do we know William Marshall from <laughs> other than Blackula? Pee-wee. Uh, yeah, Pee-wee. <laughs> he's on Pee Wee's show, but he was also he was a huge Shakespearean was on actor. Pee-wee's yeah, show? wasn't he the king of uh, I, the king I of cartoons or something? On the, yeah, uh, the other, yeah, on the Pee Wee's show. Who was the other black Pee Wee's Playhouse? Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne as the cowboy. Yes, right, right. Yeah. right. 
But yeah, Black you're... people on Pee Wee's Playhouse. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a whole other. How is new that? Part how is that not some show. little hipster band's name? <laughs> Black people on Pee Wee's Playhouse. <laughs> <laughs> also, you you imagined a biopic. This was sweet with your friend Sherman, played by John the great the, the late great John Cazal. Yes, yeah, the moviegoer. Uh, yeah, Uncle Percy's the moviegoer. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, that would be a good Sherman biopic. Yeah, just I mean, because John Cazal only got to do those five movies and that one episode of Street San Francisco, and then gone. Five but big movies. It's yeah. so it's so insane. Yeah, he does five movies, but five iconic movies. Yeah, they're all two best pictures. Ama- yeah. Three, three best pictures. Three, Godfather two, and, and and was and was insanely memorable in Deer all Hunter. of them. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, play, it, and playing characters that would normally he would would fade into the background oh, yes. with the less actor, but he made them and so real. The conversation, incredible. Uh, uh, Deer Hunter. Uh, let's see, the two Dog Godfather Day afternoon. pictures oh, and Dog Day. God, and oh, Dog Day afternoon, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. 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 That haircut. Oh, in Dog Day, he was great. He's so Nolos. good. He was. It was really weird because I did a movie, a little movie called Big Fan, and my mom is played by Marsha Jean Kurtz, who's one of the bank tellers in Dog Day Afternoon, and um, in there, there's a Spike Lee film called The Inside Man. I like that picture. And she also yeah. plays a bank teller with the exact same name, cool. as her character in Dog. And she says while the question goes, "You know, I've been held up before." <laughs> and it's supposed to be the same character. Like oh, it's years like an later. in joke, a little in joke. Oh, if you I know love who that. she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talk a lot about Lumet on this show. We talk. Oh, Sidney Lumet. I was just talking about the other day. Talk about that guy. He does what? 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 Didn't he do Dog Day Afternoon, Serpico, and then Murder on the Orient? Yes. Like yes. The, the the craziest to get away shift. from to change, but to change still, it up. But still, but but Murder on the Orient Express is so weirdly violent. And dark. It's yes. G rated, but that murder scene at the end in the blue light when they're all yep. stabbing the guy yep. is nightmarish. Yep, it's great. It's one of your favorite movie moments, too. I saw and, the uh, yes. uh, uh, Poirot. Mm-hmm. And he did another movie I that's a favorite of mine, even though it's not a perfect film. And mm-hmm. and he himself thought it wasn't perfect. The Wiz? And, uh, no. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's where there's no scene that's <laughs> passable in that uh, one. But bye bye, Braverman. You were talking about that on the on the show, and when you mentioned that Sorrel Brook was in it, I'm like, yeah. now I got to go. Oh, yeah. I went and downloaded it to watch it. Sorrel Brook plays this kind of eff- effeminate, swishy writer yes. with this big red electric typewriter, and it's kind of just a day in the life. It's it's really good. Joseph Wiseman shows up in it too. Doctor yeah. No and and Jack Warden. I mean, great actors. Yeah, but but it but it has the pacing and the stakes of these little precious indie films. Yeah, that you would see at Sundance now, but they were making this in the early seventies. Like the, the stakes are so low, but you but you care when you look at his body of work and you look at things, and then you look at things like Prince of the City and 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 Twelve Angry Men and mm-hmm. and Pawn Broker yeah. and I mean it's just a, it's a wonderful output. He, he and the did, verdict. And the verdict yeah. and um, Q and A and Q and A right and, and oh, then the, um, what is it before oh, the, the that, devil knows you're dead? Uh, yes, that's a great one. Yes, yeah, <laughs> very. Powerful. That's the last one I think. Yeah, but I think he was like in his seventies, and yeah. it looks like it was made by a twenty three year old on great. Adderall. Yeah, like it's so, so <laughs> it's much great. crazy energy to it. He and did. and that was one of those movies that those rarities when you got those movies that grab you in the first minute. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was one of those ones. I mean, also it was it's Sidney Lumet just going with with his life from his skill, and then that cast. Yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, it's a wonderful so picture. Of course, you're into it. Yeah, he he his he wrote a book called Making Movies that is so kind of squirmingly honest about like he goes, I've done a couple of movies where you realize halfway through. Well, this movie's going to suck. We didn't do it, but I got to finish it because. And then you watch previews, going, "Yep, this is this was yeah." And and he he never says what the movies are, but you can kind of guess. Matthew Broderick was sitting in that chair talking about family business. Oh, was he? And saying he didn't understand it, and he still doesn't. Yeah, I think that's (laughs) the one where, um, in the book, he he all but says because he goes, "I got all these huge stars." It was one of those things like it can't miss, and we're watching the early cuts. I'm like, "This is no one's going to go see." Such and a bomb. and it sense. was weird. I guess Sean Connery was supposed to be Irish in that, even though he's doing a Scottish but accent. But he never doesn't do it. He's right. always a right. Scottish he's guy. All, yeah. And, and then, so he's yeah. got a, this strong Scottish accent, but he's Irish. 
and his son is Italian, Italian <laughs> and his grandson is Jewish. His son right. is Dustin Hoffman. Right. Yeah. And right. then his, oh, his was, son is Italian, but he converts for his wife. And that's how Matthew Broderick is Jewish. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. God. Right. So, what so, was the so plot an Irish guy, an Irish guy's playing a Jew. The Jew's playing an Italian <laughs> guy, and the Scotsman's playing an Irishman. Yes, yeah, this you is like got the it. setup to the shittiest joke. But it also wasn't the cast. It was one of those movies where you know De Niro was supposed to be. In oh, he it, was? It was a totally different cast. And, wow! And they just cobbled it together with. And they're pulling off this uh, criminal operation because of some Chinese guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. B.D. Wong, I think. Yeah, I cannot yeah. even remember this. Oh, my God. I can't even remember this movie. Yeah, yeah. that's I a head scratch. It's, it's one of those movies that you watch and you immediately forget. There's no, there's nothing to cling to. No. Nothing stays with you. No. And they all must have been so, oh, my God. I'm Because that was probably right after Connery won his Oscar. Also for playing an Irish guy with a Scottish Correct. accent. Still yes, won an Oscar. Yes. They're like, well, oh, Broderick's <laughs> father's in Dog Day, so he wanted to work with Lumet. James Broderick is the, he is? Is the cop. Oh, at the end. At the end. That it came, could you put your gun down? Correct. And then he shoots Kazao in the head. So he knew. So he was on the Dog Day set as a kid, and he knew Lumet. No, and they'd kidding. never worked together, and this was their chance to work together. I didn't. Okay. Yeah, but oh. it it just didn't happen. Wow, that makes so much sense. But I still don't care. Movie's yeah. terrible. And, and yeah. I always <laughs> like Prince of the City because, unlike Serpico, which is a great movie, mm-hmm. Prince of the City really makes it more. Uh, you know, Serpico is black and white. Yeah. And Prince of the City, you go, you know, you're not sure who to side with. Right. And, and even the, the main guy, Treat Williams, clearly at the end doesn't even know, am I good or bad? Like, he's yeah. just so adrift. And they he shoots it so well where he starts off with all those big wide shots, and the shots keep getting tighter and tighter till at the end you're just stuck. It's so claustrophobic watching that film. And it was also the first time that anyone looked at Jerry Orbach and went, that's a cop. Yeah, because up to that right. point he was that's a right. fun song and dance man. They're that's like, right. "Yeah, no. that's right." Pop. We and you know, that face, and that and then that was it. We love character actors like you love oh. character actors. We had Tony Robertson here as in Serpico. No, that's we right. love to get these guys in here, and we had Bruce Dern, and we had Tony Lobianco. I know you like uh, oh, uh, what's Honey, the what's, honeymoon killers? Oh yeah, the the Cohen picture too. Uh, the the one with Andy Kaufman. Oh, 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 I thought you, uh, I got it. They said the Cohen brothers. No, no, we, we the, had um, Larry, Larry Cohen, Cohen picture. Cohen God told here. me to. Yeah, yeah, we had Larry, we had Larry Cohen, Cohen in here on. too, which I was think surreal. You, I think you already told the story in the show when, when, when he was at Con, he was at Can with uh, Q, the Winged Serpent, correct. And Roger Ebert went and saw it, and 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 he yes. comes out. He, so you know the story. Yeah, sees Larry and Arkoff. Right. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, you have the most. Amazing method act, act acting job I've ever seen in the middle of all this shit. And then Harker goes, the shit was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. And, and like proud of himself. Yeah, like, yeah of course. They, the great thing about when Larry Cohen was on this show, it's like you're listening to him and you're going, I think 99% of this is bullshit, but he's so much fun. Like that nobody had a rifle in the opening yeah. scene when the guy's on the tower, when the sniper's on the tower in, in God Told Me To. And they for, and the prop guy doesn't bring a gun, and he's got something like six hundred extras yeah, oh yes. down in the street, and no gun. And he got on a bullhorn. He said, "Does anybody have a rifle?" Yes. <laughs> oh my God. And some woman in the crowd said, "What we do," and ran home and got a rifle. And that was the rifle that they used in the movie. I do, but you oh, hope geez. these stories are true. I hope they are. I mean, I do know that he um, he told her about how when the the scene where Andy Kaufman is the cop. Who goes on the shooting spree? Yeah, he. They, it was. An, I guess. I guess they just went in guerrilla style in an, in an actual parade, kind of. And oh, Coffin yeah. started taunting the parade goers, and they were going to like kill him. Like they were going to start a fight, and they had to get the scene done quickly. That I believe. I could see Andy Kaufman just fucking yeah. with these people. But yeah, it was. Um, I don't know. He gave a really Larry Cohen gave this really cool interview years ago where he said, "You know, Superman. Superman never made sense to me because." He comes down to Earth in a spaceship in the 50s, and Ma and Pa can't find him. It's in Kansas, in America in the 50s. So they're going to take him to church every Sunday. And little baby Clark Kent's going to be sitting there, little kid Clark Kent. And they're talking about this guy named Jesus who comes out of the sky, who has powers and abilities that no one else has. And he's going to start going, well, I think I'm Jesus. I think that's what they're talking about. <laughs> and he wouldn't have become a reporter. Like, he would have started a religion or something. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. That was such an interesting take. 
He's in that. L.A. You should look him up. You should take him to lunch and hang out with him. He's a lot of fun. Yeah, I would imagine. I think he'd spark I've met you. him at a couple of uh, things, and I've, I think I got a card from him once, and I lost it, or I just, ugh. But uh, someday, hopefully, I'll get to hang with that. But he, he just seems like a really... He's made some very weird moves. The stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh God. Yeah. So good. Oh, and those black exploitation pictures mm. are crazy. Oh, black yeah. Caesar. Black Caesar. Yeah. And yeah. Hell up in Harlem. Hell and yeah. he's got, yeah, listen to that episode for just, you know, they never got permits. <laughs> <laughs> just didn't. Talk, I mean, real guerrilla filmmaking. Yeah. And there's one called Bone with Joyce Van Patten and what? Yafit Kodo that's very disturbing that he shot in his own house. Oh, Lord. And the whole movie's on YouTube. If you got nothing to do one night for two hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a weird fever dream. But talk Done. about the stuff in the book, and it's kind of touching, you know, the, your, your relationship with, uh, with Sherman and, the, and your $5 a night film school. Yeah. I, the, I used the, to, the, the beloved New Beverly. <clears throat> I used to go to the New Beverly. Uh, now, it, you know, it's being renovated. Quentin Tarantino bought it, and he's, re, he, he's oh, totally no. refurbishing it. But back in the day, you could see a double feature every night for five bucks. And I just got a, a, a cheap film education. But I remember I would, I would talk to Torgan, but he was always in the ticket booth. Like he was just this little face in the ticket booth, like this little Yoda figure. And I remember I went there the first time, May of 1995, to see Ace in the Hole and Sunset Boulevard. That was my first double feature there. And then I went back. And I, I mean, I kept going every night. But then I remember four years into it, they were showing that double feature again. And I went to buy my ticket, and Sherman was like, oh, hey, Pat. And he goes, I thought you'd be showing me a screenplay by now. Like, it was his way of going, you need to go and do some stuff. Like, you've seen enough movies. Go make a movie. That's, like, kind of, like, kind that's of, cool. Go write a movie. So it was that little, like, he just kept track. Of, like, he saw the world through that screen, but he remembered everyone that came in and out. And I, there was a, um, uh, back in the day when you'd go, uh, a couple times I was there, uh, um, Lawrence Tierney would show up. And I was watching. <laughs> I was there watching Citizen Kane one day for that 900th time, and I'm half an hour into the movie, enjoying it, and this someone sits down behind me. I, I can hear the guy, and then um, he just starts. T whoever this is starts talking to the screen and about the movie, like look at the fat ass on that bitch. That guy, oh, he's oh, you're kissing her, but everyone knows you're a fag. This, this. And and I was gonna like turn around and go like, would you shut the fuck up? And it's Lawrence Tierney just. Rattling off like Lawrence. I knew that asshole, that fucking bitch. <laughs> that fucking asshole, this guy. Man. And and then it became great. Like this is the best DVD commentary I've ever heard. And now I'm really like kind of digging it. And I I get like half an hour of him just dishing on everyone. And it was and and when I say dishing, it was just like and that motherfucker right there, and that other fucking asshole. And then his little handler came in, some kid, and was like, "Oh, Larry, there you are. Come on, we got to go, man." And then Lawrence Lawrence Tierney stands up. And says, uh, I ain't never seen this cocksucker before. It ain't bad. <laughs> and then he let, like, he just saw half an hour of Citizen Kane out of context. <laughs> that's not bad. Even though, according to him, that's ah, all full of fags and bitches. That ass is all that kind of You, you, <laughs> of course, a very important topic. You brought up mm -hmm. Sunset Boulevard. Oh, boy. Now, I got into a talk with, of old people, <laughs> Jackie the Joke Man <laughs> about this. Oh, it yeah. was Jackie. That's right. Yeah. And, and you know, in the beginning of the movie, she's holding a funeral for her beloved pet chimp. Right. And story has I bet has you don't know it. where he's going here, Patton. No, I don't. Story has it that rich women back then, like especially in Hollywood where this depravity was going on, chimps were trained to perform cunnilingus <laughs> on so these women would buy trained chimps to perform cunnilingus on them. This is according to Jackie Martling. And, Jackie Martling. Mm -hmm. And 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 she but then I I looked it up on the internet and they <laughs> wait, said oh, wait, wait, you oh. That up? And, so, and so you went to the verifiable source, yes, the internet yes. to get the solid information. <laughs> Let's back up. This could be bullshit. Let's go to the internet. Where there's let's, no bullshit. Let's, let's go to the internet. You so wanted it to be true. Where where they're reporting John Travolta died today. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's go check that out. That that old the old gray lady, the internet. The, okay, but hang on. Let's say that is true. Yeah. Let's say they were training chimps 
to perform comedy. I'm but willing to say it's true. But, okay, but but when chimps get older, don't they go crazy and get feral and yeah. they like break people's jaws and eat their faces off? Like, <laughs> the, why why did we never hear about some actress? Getting killed by her <laughs> pussy eating chimp. Gil? Well, the studio <laughs> would fix bury it. With the fixers. <laughs> Eddie Mannix. They would set fire <laughs> to the house she was in, and her corpse would be destroyed. Well, 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 according, part of that story was that Wilder goes up to Gloria Swanson and gives her that piece of direction yes. at the beginning. Oh, what? yes, yes. yes. Wilder said, uh, remember, you're fucking the chimp. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you're fucking the chimp. <laughs> All right, we're losing the light quickly. <laughs> we're and, fucking. And, and you mentioned uh, Ace in the Hole, which was oh, also the terrific. great, the big carnival. Yeah, yeah, big carnival. Yeah. And also, you know, the slang term for that movie was why? Because it failed so horribly. Because he was riding such a high. Right. He's like, this is the movie I want to do. I got control now, and they called it "Ass in the Ringer" because it lost so much goddamn money. And it was funny such a bomb. Thing is, it's it became like then such a respect. Pretty ballsy thing. movie. Oh god, it was so ballsy for its day. Yeah, and because it really is ahead of the time on talking about the media and how and, false and, and fake news and 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 yes. how the how the news is whatever you decide to make it. We will just keep changing the story. It was really. I, I think it was just, and, but it, he it, it he he delivers the message with such a fucking sledgehammer because <laughs> Kirk Douglas is such an asshole where they no garlic pickles like he's just whole cast is great yeah oh that whole yeah the, the whole the, the guy from that played Animal in Stalag Seventeen who's just dying slowly in this goddamn mine yes Leo we're waiting for you Leo whatever they remember they're singing and to him. they're changing it where uh, they have a way to rescue him early. Way quicker, and he, yeah. And, and uh, Kurt Douglas and the sheriff bury it because they want him in the mine longer because they're making so much money. And when he slaps the wife right. to make her cry for the news. Kurt Douglas was not afraid to play an asshole. No. You look at the bad and the beautiful. Oh, and some my of those, God. Some of those performances. I think Mad City. I think that Travolta That was Hoffman a remake movie of, of, is a Ace in the Hole remake. Yeah, it was an Ace in the Hole yeah. remake. Yeah. And not and very good. New. No. Yeah. Yeah, Travolta and Hoffman. Tell the story, too, and it's it's a sweet no. story. Can you tell that Casablanca story about the new Beverly? Oh, this is going to make me so sad. Oh, you don't have to tell well, it. But it's sweet. It's uh, in the it book. It is sweet. Okay, yeah. Um, one night, the new Beverly, it was Friday night, raining. Go see Casablanca for my 20th time um, with all the other weirdos who, again, you know, I look back on it now. I'm like, I was in my 20s. I, was, I wasn't I was bad looking. I could have been, but I was like, no, I want to be in the dark with these 80-year-old um, film freaks with their, <laughs> you know, just seeing this movie for 100 times. And, I, and I'm watching Casablanca and right near, the, it's literally like, like, like in a comedy sketch. It's right as they're saying goodbye at the airport. He goes, I mean, listen, sweetheart, I promise you. And then the, the, the uh, film broke. At that moment, which is, everyone's like, oh, God. But it was so bad for, for it to break at that moment. It was also funny. So we kind of started laughing. And then you could hear them fixing the projector. And they didn't turn the lights on. We're just sitting there. And everyone just started whistling as time goes by in the dark while they fixed it. The whole theater. I love that. On a rainy Friday night, there were maybe 30 of us in this theater. So just like, if you, if you could have done one of those montage scenes of like it's 1996 in LA let's cut to this dance club this bar this movie premiere this you know restaurant and then these 30 people just alone in this little theater in the rain whistling and then just cut to the next thing like that was going on somewhere in the city that night like there's just that's right. that, yeah, that's that the imagery to me paint is, in the book it's, it's yeah, vivid yeah. it's now, vivid now it's funny cuz you talk about your childhood there or your teenage and 20s mm -hmm. And I remember during my teens, uh, they used to have revival houses all over Manhattan. Oh, oh God. wait a minute. What year was this? Like in the God. 70s or 60s? 60s and 70s? 40. Well, there was the biograph. There was the Regency. Yeah. The there late, was the failure. The late 60s, early 70s was the heyday of revival theaters in New York. It was non St. Mark's Cinema. And the, I would, the, the Waverly. Waverly. Gone. And I would go to them a lot. I would catch old movies, uh, you know, old Marx Brothers movies or obscure films. And the funny thing is now when I look back on it 
and picture myself going to those theaters. It makes me very sad. It kind of makes me sad, too. Like, what was drawing me into the darkness during the years when I should have been out in the sun? Like, like my, my <laughs> wife now, I've, I've remarried, and she was one of those people that— and she she's an actress and she's amazing. Her name is Meredith Salinger. She was she was in Dream a Little Dream. Yes, of course we she met backstage. Yeah. She, yes, you I, met backstage. I met her in the green she room. was quite a hottie, as oh, I remember. S- still is, but yeah, and, I, but be, I, in fact, in fact, what I I'm sure I must have jerked off <laughs> to one of her movies. She'll be so pleased. Yeah, that, yeah, yes. that's a that's so a JD time, Salinger. Next yeah. time you're. <laughs> Next time you're having sex with your oh, wife. Oh, I'll make sure to mention that. So, <laughs> picture by the me, way, picture me is... jerking off, <laughs> sitting in oh a movie God. theater with my dick in my hands, jerking off to your wife while you're... As a matter of fact, next time you're having sex with your wife, imagine you're fucking me. <laughs> You got Dave on that one. Yes, oh yes. Oh, my God. I, for the rest oh. of your life, anytime oh. you have sex uh. with your wife, you'll picture that you're really fucking wow. me. Wow, thanks. See you in 10 years, erections. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 10. <laughs> oh, God. Um, but, you know, she was... She didn't see a lot of movies because, no, is that, are you kidding? She's I was, making movies. I was making movies, but right. I was also at the beach, and I was, you know, going out with hot guys and enjoying life, and I was just in the dark. But but I just, but I love those little moments, these weird pockets of time. Like, I remember reading about there was some little coffee shop in the village back in the early 70s that, um, I forget what it was called, but during the day, um, Richard Pryor and George Carlin before they who were who they were. Oh, was that uh, would, Hansons or something? Might have been, but they would they would they Hansen's would they would store. like do yeah. handoffs just doing stand up to whoever was sitting there, and it was like eight people, and they would then they would like pat, and like people would just ignore them like the fuck is this shit, you know? Because they were, you know, they, they were kind of going through their transformation. So again, you could do that montage of late sixties, early seventies. New York City where, you know, this amazing thing is going on on Broadway and there's a thing at the Met and this restaurant and this scene. And then you cut to this little coffee shop. And these two guys who are going to be giant someday. That's great. Are eight people are just like, oh, God, shut the hell up. You know, like I just love those little moments. That's what this show is about. Stuff we missed. It really is, yeah. er Errors we missed out on and things we didn't didn't actually get to experience. Why weren't you there for that? Yeah. Someone pointed out that the hotel that I'm staying at, there's a little bodega next door. We were pulling up today, and they're like, "See that bodega?" I'm like, "Yeah, that used to be Max's Kansas City." I'm like, "What?" Yep, it's literally Max. It was, and now it's a little bodega. New York's changed, my friend. Oh, and you, and it will always. Every ten years, you'll come back, and half of it's gone. Are you worried about the the demise of movie theaters? As, as I'm you, worried now more about. I'm not as worried about the demise of movie theaters. I'm worried about the demise of just a basic knowledge of of just a basic outline of film history because it's going to let a lot of um, people that are audacious but not talented get away with rewarming stuff and being hailed as geniuses or being, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. there's, it'll be less, I mean, there will always be originality, but originality is going to have to fight harder and harder for air. But the thing that's really scaring me right now in LA are all these weird little uh, small business uh, stores that are run by people that aren't necessarily in it for the profit. It's almost like they have their collection of stuff on display. So there's like a weird little bookstore like Dark Delicacies or a little place like um, Secret Headquarters or House of Secrets or you know, or, or, or a, a, a little vintage store like Bearded Lady um, all along Magnolia. And, and what happened, like I was driving through Silver Lake where Silver Lake has all these great little vinyl record stores and eateries and little, you know, clothing stores and knickknack stores and at, at right near Rosemont and Sunset now there's a giant one of those three plexes with a Starbucks a Chipotle and a hamburger habit right smack in the middle of Silver Lake now in LA and East LA and I'm like that's the beginning of the end it's of all changed. the small businesses oh yeah once that thing lands think of that as like remember that movie the monolith monsters yeah those rocks and they would land and they would just start taking over the landscape that's what that is and then mom and be- pop businesses just will disappear because the the the, the uh, landlords go oh wait a minute but here's what sucks i have nothing against chipotle and starbucks great but they're 
they are accessible everywhere. Yeah. But the two blocks of Magnolia that have those weird little stores, that's the only place you can go there. And every week, no, they don't make crazy money during the week, but on the weekend, they do great because that's the only place you can go get them. And then people go shopping. Then they go to a Starbucks. And they want to gut all those stores and drop Starbucks in there. They want to drop a Starbucks half a mile from the Starbucks you were going to go to when you were done antiquing. Same thing's happening here on the Upper East Side. Oh, it is? Yeah, sure. Sure. It was Yorkville. I mean, it was, you know, it was a, it was oh, a, it yeah. was a German neighborhood, and it was all mom-and-pop shops for years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, until recently, and it's being driven out by that kind of stuff. And you see the, you know, so the bakery that was, that's been there since 1919 closes. It's just this, and, yeah, and, and slow, like, and they don't. And it bothers me, like, that, again, I have no problem with capitalism and profit, but it's like what Starbucks makes twenty billion a year, but someone in the world goes. But what if we made twenty one? How yeah. does that? How does twenty one change anything from twenty at that point? You've made it. You should actually relax. That's, that's like that uh, part in Chinatown. How? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like how much richer? Can how you? much? Yeah. How much better can you eat? Yeah. How much better can you eat? What can you buy that you can already afford? <laughs> the future, Mr. Gitch. <laughs> are those, are those but, cool stores still there, like Larry Edmonds Bookshop in Hollywood and, uh, and Script City and those but, places but, but still like hanging on? Hanging on by their fingertips. I'm sure. I, I, I was, remember, too, like when I was at, in my teens and 20s, I would walk around the in the street, and there would junk stores... That you'd go in, you could kill your entire day in yeah. one of those stores. Yeah. Roll bookstores where you could go and kill an entire oh, day. Oh, well, like, <clears throat> right, Strands is still there, but there Thank used God. to be yeah. about a yeah. hundred I'm gonna... of these tiny bookstores But around. the thing that was, was, was great about those stores was not only were they selling books, they were also selling The Hunt. Of course. we Part of... Of, of filling yourself with endorphins is the hunt. Yeah. And yes. we're getting rid of the hunt. Record stores too. Yeah. And that's why I was, I, I did a lot of stuff on record store day, the whole vinyl yeah. thing. Like the oh, that's hunt. great. Talk about it. Because they're all holding on. It, the, you know, Amoeba Records might be going away or might Ugh. shrink, you know, and all these other places. So it really, I don't know. It, it gives me the heebie jeebies a little bit because it, it makes me look at Noah Cross and try, at least Noah Cross was trying to build a future of water and whatever it was he was trying to build these people they don't even they don't even want to own the future they, they want to there is no future if yeah. everything is just chipotle starbucks hamburger habit chipotle starbucks is just boom boom and, that's it and i can easily see a day very nearby where there are no movie theaters absolutely oh, we're heading, I can we're see heading that. toward it we're heading there and that's really I moved really back scary from, i moved to new york i moved back to new york in, in 2003 from L.A., and I think at least 15 theaters have disappeared in the in the 13 years, 14 years that I've been back. I mean, and the, none of those revival houses exist anymore. Oh, they, and then the, the goddamn Ziegfeld went away. And, you and know, which I, was, wait, what? It's gone. Yeah, Ziegfeld's gone. It's gone. Oh, shit. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. And, and nothing to replace it, believe me. I remember the Waverly would... Um, Made that the, when when they had El Topo that the 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 legendary oh, yes. distributor Ben Barinholtz yes and he, um, we worked with the Coens yeah yeah he he right. but he famously it he took out newspaper ads the size of a postage stamp just said El Topo at midnight and then in the window of the thing, no poster just a car, piece of cardboard El Topo at midnight no one knew what that meant and word of mouth just. That's how, because I remember there's a, there was a, a Simpsons writer named George Meyer that was like, you know, things that are just inherently good and interesting will catch on without, like, th- that's why, so when they have these gigantic ad campaigns for milk or the family, well, something's kind of weird about those. But something like yoga or some weird little movie, they have, there's no giant, there's no yoga council. It just, people do it and go, um, look, I know it's going to sound really weird me saying that it really works, it's great, go do it, you know. <laughs> right. It does work, it doesn't need the giant, it's the stuff that is inherently shitty that needs the giant push because it's not all that good. And and I've noticed, too, in newspapers, which saying the word newspaper is, sounds ancient. Oh, my God, yeah. You there could, used to be a whole big section 
of ads for movies. Yeah, I got some. You some fans have been sending those to me. They've been sending me old newspapers from the seventies yeah. and sixties mm. with the full page ads where there's like oh. twenty. I'll, I'll share see them with those. you. I'll there's share them no with you guys. They're great. Movie section in newspapers no. anymore. No. And yeah. There won't be well, like you said, everybody in tomorrow. you know soon everybody will have a theater in their in their house. The, t- yeah. the TVs are getting or even worse. The- but then the home theater is going to go away because what's going to happen is that too. They're doing the VR thing where you can put a headset on and it creates the experience of being and you'll watch. You know, you'll plug in something the size of a cigarette pack, but it'll feel like you're sitting in the arc light or the Cinerama Dome. That's how big the screen will seem to you. And you'll have on noise-canceling headphones. You'll have this great sound. Now, look, fine. I, I'm not against anyone's amusement, but a movie, you will see a movie different. You'll see different things about it when you watch it with a bunch of people. Of course. There's nothing you'll like it. You'll see it all differently that, with a bunch of people. That That's the thing. That experience. Well, number one. Uh, putting your shoes on and going to a movie theater. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then being in a movie theater where everyone laughs at the same time, screams at the same yeah. time. Or it, even when you're in a movie that's not working is so fascinating. When you're, when there's a comedy and they've clearly landed what they thought was going to be a joke and the audience is like, uh, yeah, uh, yes. Like that, to me, I love. It's a group thing. It's a it group. really is a group thing. Yeah. And then the, especially... The other thing I miss about Revive, and I'm so jealous of you, you were, because not only did you have access to all these rep theaters, but you had access to Times Square and all those grind yes. houses where oh, yeah. you never knew what was playing. Some weird thing that would, that would, like, there's there's a guy, one of my favorite filmmakers, is a guy named Andy Milligan. Andy Milligan made Torture Garden and The Rats Are Coming, The Werewolves Are Here, and um, Dr. Jekyll's Sister Hyde. He was the, um, the ghastly ones. He was the, he, he was, he made like Ed Wood, Look like Wes Anderson. His shit was so <laughs> awful. And sounds- half of his filmography is gone because he would make films for these grindhouse theaters. They would show them for the weekend, and then the distributor would, they would call the distributor going, where do we mail this back? And they're like, oh, we don't fucking we'll toss it. We don't want it. We're not paying the postage for that shit. Just, you know, send us the money you made, and we're, we're done. I don't care. Well- and um, and he would... Uh, so, so and, and, and he would just... so But there was no such thing as previewing it, a poster, nothing. Right, you walked right. in and the ghastly one, what the fuck is this? I, so I those days are gone, in, too. In Times no. Square, well, they would have porn and kung yeah. fu movies. But, or, but but slasher movies like Maniac. Yes. Or you could see Abel Ferrara pictures like or, Driller Killer or, I, or I stuff saw like that. In Times, <laughs> this 45. In Times Square, so, I saw it's all gone. Make Them Die Slowly. Yes. And wait a minute. Catch Them and Kill Them. Make Which them die I'm, slowly I'm is, the, say, is the jungle one, like the cannibals? Yes, yeah. both yes. of them. Both of them yeah. would have like uh, a half a minute scene in Ma- Manhattan, and then they'd go to the jungle with actual tribes. Yeah, yeah. And and I basically, I think the correct term is uh, fucking guineas. <laughs> He's obsessed with these Italian directors who were working under in the states under under pseudonyms. Well, who was? Well, I mean, initially they made Doctor Butcher. Th- they made Sergio Leone work under a pseudonym. Yes. They didn't get, let him use his own name. Yes, yes. But yeah, there was this guy that was the he was the asylum films of his time. He did The Visitor and Tentacles, and where he would see a movie that was coming out was going to be, and he would very quickly crank out a. Like, an imitation. Like an imitation. Yeah. And this movie called The Visitor that was his, it's The Exorcist, but also Close Encounters. It was a, he like slapped together three fucking movies. Don't even know this movies. And the And the goddamn cast, it's like um, uh, uh, um, Glenn Ford and John Huston. It is the nuttiest goddamn movie. It's called The Visitor. You ha- oh, you have to go see I know a movie guy. called The Night Visitor. Do you know this no, picture with no, Max no. von Sydow? No. About a guy who escapes from a mental hospital at night and commits killings and then sneaks back into the mental hospital? <laughs> that you know this picture? Familiar. Sounds no, great. Also worth seeing. Now, now, a more recent film that's one of these, like, low budget, but let's see what movies work and slap them together. <laughs> There's one movie. It has to do with finding lost footage and it's it's after the Blair Witch Project uh-huh. came out. Well, there were a ton of those oh, after the Blair Shark Witch. one. It so was they open, found open water. lost footage. So it's all very shaky, mm-hmm. cheap camera work, and where they're stuck in a place with dinosaurs. So it's a it's a hybrid 
a Blair Witch in Jurassic Park. Holy shit. Yeah. This isn't Roger Corman's Carnosaur, is it? No, Carnosaur no, no. is the movie with... Uh, the, I think Clint Howard's in Carnosaur, yeah, hasn't and, he? And he probably is. <laughs> I think he is. <laughs> and, I know you got a Clint what, Howard thing. What's your name? Laura Dern. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we had Corman here too, which was oh, that must have been amazing. Surreal. Just to have Corman and 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 Larry Cohen and Dick Miller. Wait a minute, Laura Dern wasn't in Carnosaur, was she? Well, wait, wait, no, because which she was, one's the Jurassic? Park? That's Laura that's Dern Laura and Dern. Sam Neill. Is it Diane? Or what's her name? Diane Ladd, her mother is in Carnosaur. Oh, yeah, maybe. Is her mom in maybe. Carnosaur? Yeah, I think she's the mad I gotta go scientist. Look that up right now. Paul, oh, research. And yeah, well, okay. And <laughs> sometime in this next decade, Paul will come up with that. But you know, again, I there were these little. I remember there was this movie I was obsessed with for years to the point where I did a bit about it called Deathbed, the bed that eats, and it's about a bed that indeed is obsessed by, possessed by a demon, and when people fuck on the bed, the bed eats them. It was it was a way to get like soft core, and then they would the people would just get dissolved by the bed, mm -hmm. and um, and, and it was this legendary like lost film, and but then someone found a picture of Times Square, one of these grant with deathbed on the marquee, which were probably played for a day, and then vanished, and then eventually it showed up again like ten years, what showed up like five or six years ago on DVD, and I did a screening of it at the Alamo Draft House just so that I could see it, and like I should see this movie. It's so they, fucking bad. There was some movie. Uh, believe it or not, low budget, uh, and and it had to do with a deadly a, a girl with this deadly vagina that had teeth. It was in called it. teeth. Yeah, oh, teeth. Movie was okay. called teeth, and her vagina grew teeth. Yes, and vagina. <laughs> den, what do they call that? Vagina dentata. Vagina dentata. Right. Thanks, uh, <laughs> Sigmund Freud. Right. Yeah, oh, there's Sounds a lot like of, the mean, Lion King song. Yeah. <laughs> so, like the sci fi channel, <laughs> Vagina. <laughs> what what is that? <laughs> well, Diane no, Ladd, we have a. Uh, we Diane have a, Ladd. Yes, thank oh. you. Oh, my Lord. Thank you, Crack Research Team. Um, But yeah, the. Uh, you, you know, places like the Asylum, thank you, and, and then also just people that are doing direct to video stuff. That, that's that's the, the new ground, Grindhouse now. Yeah. You know? And also, like, there's stuff. Netflix has this sort of hidden basement now. Uh, when you go searching for horror and sci-fi, there's suddenly, if you go like to row eight or nine, it's suddenly these movies are like, where the fuck did this come from? And you give it a check out. It's pretty cool. By the way, I, I remember being in Times Square. And and they still, the idea of double features, that's in the, gone. Yeah, also gone. Yeah. But there was a, I wish to Christ I had <laughs> brought a camera. <laughs> with me yeah because there was a double feature of ford Fairlane and problem child oh my god so it was wow like a, so gilbert, gilbert godfrey extravaganza festival. wow that's disturbing there's wow. there, there are some moments in in ford Fairlane. my brother was pointing out to me that the movie ford Fairlane doesn't work but <laughs> there are these individual moments that are so goddamn funny when he after he comes and sees you and I remember because the exterior is shot in front of the Directors Guild building on Sunset. It's like, it's like if the camera panned over, he'd be across from the Laugh Factory. Yes. And you've just said, I'll give you like $1,000, but you only give him, you go, no, no dessert till after you finish. You only give him 100 And then he walks out and it's his voice where he goes, money, 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 money. Oh, money. Yes. <laughs> and he does this weird little like kind of uh, Dutch kick. Dance. It's, it's the weirdest moment. And it makes me laugh so hard every time. <laughs> It's just out of nowhere. I saw you and Karen, your friend Karen, doing the uh, grabbing the, the the blast of silence where they turned you loose yes. in the uh, in the Academy. Got film to go to the Academy archives, archives and go watch yeah. Blast of Silence. Yeah, um, yeah they're going to let me start doing that again. Uh, you know, the TCM is doing their um, their big film festival. They're they're opening their vault, and the thing that they're showing this Saturday, but I don't think I can see it because it's at midnight and of a very early Sunday, is one of my favorite movies. It's a Timothy Carey film. Oh, I know this picture. You know it. it oh, God. What John it? Cassavetti's favorite yes. comedy. Yes, yes, yes. The World's Greatest Sinner. Right. World's Greatest Sinner is this movie. Gilbert, you have to see this goddamn movie. <laughs> it's Timothy Carey, um, who is a fucking lunatic, and he wrote, produced, shot, starred in, directed, edited this movie. It took him five years to make. He would make it piecemeal. He would shoot some... And he would kind of, so he kind of. It's legendary. It's legendary. Yeah. And it's this black and white movie about a guy who, who decides he's got an insurance salesman. Who decides he's got and forms a rock and roll band, forms a religion. And um, it, and, and the soundtrack is was done by a then 18-year-old. I used to know this. 
Give me a hint. Uh, well, I, I can't really think of a hint. I'm just going to okay. tell you. Okay. Frank Zappa. Yes. And uh, it is it is so goddamn bonkers, but really, really funny. Okay, we'll watch the that The World's one. Greatest Sinner. You'll see, love it. See, well, yeah. now, now this is something also that gets me. It's like years ago, they could make these weird films that yeah. are totally yeah. out there. Like Spider Baby. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. God, Sid I Hague. love Spider Baby so much. We're going to get him on the show. A- Sid and you did? We're going to. Oh, God. We're going to get him. And, and it's like now... When they make a movie that looks like it's going to be weird and out there, you know they made it totally they conscious. Were calc- right. No, yeah, like the world's greatest sinner, Timothy Carey thinks he is making a serious statement on our times. And he just, he's a he's a goddamn lunatic. Like, But, <laughs> yeah. but he does not think he's making a crazy movie. He does, He's not tongue in cheek. He's not trying to be funny. And that's what makes it so amazing. That's like a, same sub- with Spider-Baby. a subgenre of crackpot movies. Yeah. Movies made by, by guys People who think they're visionaries. Deadly serious. Yes. Yeah. Like, well, obviously The Room the, oh God, would be the, the grand, room. maybe the granddaddy all, all of All of that. Neil Breen's stuff is amazing. Neil, Neil, Neil Breen, um, I can't think of a type. Look up Neil Breen. Okay, N-E-I-L. not familiar, but I'm writing are, it down. He is the Tommy Wiseau of, uh, okay. <laughs> oh boy. Writing it down. Another star and director. And then there's a guy, oh, what the hell is his name? He made a movie called, it's either called Road to Revenge but it's also called Get Even, but the spacing on the title, he <laughs> squashes it together. So the title card says Get Even. And <laughs> okay, he look is, up. oh my God, you have to, it, it, they're, they're amazing. Even. Classic. Total vanity projects, but also I'm I'm bringing the masses something that yes. will change the world. Yes. And you watch it and go, what the fuck is wrong with this By the person? way, both of you guys did TCM Essentials. What did you pick for your with, essentials? With the late great Robert yeah, I Osborne. Did it with Ro- the so did great I. Robert yeah, Osborne. Both mm. He was terrific. Oh man, he was what so cool. Lovely guy. So cool. And, oh, and and my movies were uh The Conversation. There you go. Freaks. Well, because you're such a huge Shields and Yarnell fan. <laughs> <laughs> more they're, more, they're, they're more the Yarnell mime. than they're Shields. The, yeah, they're the mimes in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, with Cindy Williams. Yeah, with Cindy so, Williams. Very good. Mm-hmm. The conversation. Forgotten that. Freaks. Uh, uh By the way, Freaks was one of the. It was the only time in a, in a movie because I've been I've been to a lot of movies where I've seen parents just bring a kid. Yes. And then you want to go. I don't want to be the asshole that goes. Don't have your fucking kid in here. Yeah. I went to see Maniac mm-hmm. at midnight, and there was a guy holding a baby. William oh. Lustig. And, and William <laughs> Lustig introduced the film. He goes, thank you all for coming out. Uh, we made this movie back in 1979 on a wing and a prayer. Uh, Joe Spinell. And then someone went, Joe Spinell fucking rules. He goes, God bless you. He, he's dead now. So <laughs> after the movie, I'll be in the lobby. I might be in the lobby. Hang on. No, I'm leaving. All right, enjoy the movie. That was his introduction for the film. Anyway, oh, the ahead. other ones of my the original of Mice and Men with Lon Chaney, with Chaney yes. Jr. and and, a and talk the swimmer about strange films, yeah. The Swimmer with oh, Burt Lancaster and and a, and a very young Joan Rivers and, and it's based on a John Cheever short story or a John uh, Updike yes, short yes, story. Yes, yes, Cheever. John Cheever. Cheever. That movie's incredible, and and that was one of those movies. It's weird, but not with that self-conscious sense of weirdness. It's one of those that it, it's so different. It draws you in. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You can't you 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 can't turn it off. And it's got that actor in it from when we do a whole show talking about Chuck McCann in the Right Guard commercials. That Chuck oh, that McCann, guy whose name I don't know. Uh, Bill Fiore. Bill Fiore. Very good. A terrific character. My actor, God, you and he said that. Yeah, of, I cannot picture him. He's Chuck like McCann did these commercials sack. for Right Guard a million years ago. Uh-huh. Hi, guy. He would open his medicine chest, and, there was, <laughs> and, the, and the, the, the neighbor was on the other side of the medicine chest. And that was, Fiori. Fiori. was this guy, Bill Fiore. It was like a Gino Conforti type. Oh, okay. I, oh, I, I, when you were talking about um, uh, uh, Jay, uh, Tierney. Oh, boy. Uh, I, I once met um, Alice Cooper who became friends with Groucho Marx. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. And he said the two them? of them would watch The Late Show together. Oh, and, wow. And Groucho would be sitting there, he said, going, you, you see that actor <laughs> over in that scene? He was a big fag. <laughs> 
<laughs> you doing old Groucho with uh, poor Dick Cavett hanging on every word, like, please get to a joke. And the guy, and you, how do you describe him? My favorite description was he's skinny, but he somehow still has a pot belly. Yes, yes. <laughs> In my day, oh God! Oh, but the other you mentioned freaks. That was the only. That was the one time where there was a guy behind me with a kid. It was at the old silent movie theater before it came came Cinema Family. It was one time. One time when I was like, and I wasn't being mean about. It, I'm like, your kid was like eight. I'm like, you should take your kid home. He shouldn't yes. watch this. And and I'm not. And he's like, oh, it's an old movie. I'm like, this is not what you think it is, and it's really gonna mess him up. I'm just telling you. And I think they stayed for about 15 minutes, and the kid was like, I want to go. The, the whole movie oh, of Freaks, God. even when it's not a scary scene, it's still oh, scary. It's disturbing. Oh, that, that, the long through. shot of, of the woman out in the woods with them, and they're just kind of frolicking around, yeah. is so disturbing. Oh, my God. So yeah. disturbing. It, oh, God. What were the movies you picked before we lose track of it? Oh, uh, really quickly, uh, 310 to Yuma. Oh, it's a good one. The Glenn Ford Glenn, original. Glenn Ford and right. uh, uh, Van, Van Heflin. Heflin, which basically the whole movie is about an older gay dude who is his, sick of his uh, young rough trade and he wants to settle down with another rugged old bear and he tries to seduce Van Heflin. If you watch it, I mean, yeah. it's, it's he's lying in the bridal suite up in the bed just going, why don't you just join me and my gang? And his, his Glenn Ford's attendant is this guy, skinny blonde guy all in black leather. And it looks like this little like rent boy. It was. It's the weirdest. And it's an yeah, Elmore Leonard script. That's right. Yeah, they remade it not not as not too well it, with it, actually. Russell they remade Crow. it really well, but it, it was more like oh, was it? you know, um, j- just rugged, manly, violent. But the original for the fifties, and then it had the um, great song um, sung by um, the guy that sang Blazing Saddles, Judge uh, Frankie Lane. Frankie Lane. Yeah. Uh, so I showed that. I showed um, uh, the. Uh, Oh, God. Why am I blanking? Um, kind Hearts and Coronets. Oh, that's wonderful. Which is uh, Alec Guinness uh, playing seven different assholes, being killed off by an even bigger asshole. And then I uh, showed these t- this Colombian film called The Wind Journeys. Worst title for a great movie. is made in the early aughts about a guy who's convinced he has the devil's accordion and must travel to the edge of the world and throw it off. And Jesus. they just— and and he just it, it's the low budget shot in Colombia as he travels through the landscape and it's so beautiful and he's got this accordion he believes it's the devil's accordion and it makes him do weird stuff it's brilliant and then this Belgian comedy called Ultra about these two douchebags one of them is a stoner that drives a tractor combine the other one is a professor at some shitty college and they hate each other and they get into this huge fight out in this field and the combine like malfunctions and crushes both of them it makes them both quadriplegics and then they travel across Belgium in these little motorized wheelchairs to go to the company Ultra that bu- built the farm equipment to sue them and you follow these two and they become even they're paralyzed and they're even bigger assholes now and it's so it's like this classic Laurel and Hardy comedy, but they're in these little, and you see these long shots, them just buzzing along these little, it's, I, I'm not doing it justice, but it's so funny. Where do you find these offbeat pictures? These, these, uh, uh, I mean, there's this, there's this subscription service called film movement where every month okay. they go to film festivals and they find really cool films that get all this attention. You, you've seen this, you go to a film festival, film gets all these awards, and doesn't get any distribution. So they, every month they send you a new film. And they send you really interesting stuff. They sent me Ultra. And, I'm writing uh, these down. Wind Journey sounds like wind, a, They sounds, should have called sounds, it the Devil's Accordion. That sounds like a Herzog thing. It, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Pretty out there. Yeah. And then Ultra, A-A-L-T-R-A. Let Those, me ask you real quick a couple of questions from, yes. from listeners. Oh, we're God. Di- we're dying to ask you questions. I'll go quick. Chris Hankinson, uh, how is production on MST3000 going? We are starting next week, and that's all I can say. Okay. We don't want to talk about the movies that we're doing. Conniff was here. but we're do- Oh, he was. Right in that seat. But, yeah. uh, okay, but we, we're doing some pretty interesting films this time around. The, the, the last season we did, season 11, there's a film in there called Carnival Magic. My brother was a writer on that show, and he was like, I'm going to commit suicide <laughs> if I have to watch this movie because he was writing the jokes. I came in one day. And he was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill myself. I, this is the worst movie I've ever seen." Your brother Matt, my brother funny Matt, funny guy and a great Twitter feed. Funny guy, great by the Twitter way. Count. This is quick from Big Daddy uh, Patton. Welcome to the GGACP universe. <laughs> uh, you poor man. Uh, you said Repo Man was a game changing inspiration. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about either Repo Man, Barbarossa, 
or Richard Pryor live in concert? Uh, well, Richard Pryor live in concert just goes without saying. It was what made me go, oh, you can, uh, a comedian that's like watching a movie, a really good one, right. is just as good as seeing a movie because of all the little I images. I saw in the theater. Yeah, of yeah. course. Um uh, Rico, now, now, when when you saw that film, <laughs> were you aware that Marlon Brando <laughs> fucked Richard Pryor in the ass? You know what? It was weird. I saw that <laughs> movie when that I was 11, <laughs> and as, as little as I knew, I could sense. I was like, you know what? This is going to sound really weird coming out of an 11-year-old. Pretty sure that guy was fucked by Marlon Brando. <laughs> yes, he has a fucked wow. by Marlon Brando vibe coming off of him. You're a hip 11-year-old. When, when you were a little kid, you said, is that... Marlon Brando's <laughs> cum dripping down <laughs> Richard Pryor's leg. <laughs> Is that Kurt's cum on <laughs> on Pryor? He's got Kurt's cum on him. Oh. Um, Repo Man was just that thing of, it, it hit me right at the right time. I'm a teenager. I'm in the suburbs. I'm bored. Um, I, I discovered punk way too late. And just that movie about having a job where you get to be an asshole to other people, that was, the word, that was where my head was. You just take stuff from people. They can't yeah. do anything about it. And then somehow there's aliens. And, and it also was like it, it was it shot in the shittiest parts of L.A., but it makes them look so beautiful. You just want to go live. I don't know. That movie is just I, I want to live in that movie, as grimy and horrible as it is. And, and Harry Dean Stanton is nonstop We love Harry Dean Stanton. Oh, my God. He's so Wish funny. we'd have gotten him here. But I heard him on Benson's <laughs> podcast, and he basically just— he was on Doug Loves Movies at a live episode. Do you know about this? No. Oh, you can track it down. And he basically sat there and, and gave monosyllabic responses yeah. for about an hour. So uh, I could totally see we that. We didn't pursue it. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, I just got to ask you quick about Ratatouille. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, and Mike Giacchino's coming here, by the way, too, oh. in a couple of uh, weeks. Uh I'll just, yeah, the rat is anti-Semitic. And there's uh, enough yeah, clues. Let Gilbert, yeah. yeah, let Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's how it'll appeal to the masses. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't say anything sentimental. Oh, God, or, go or, ahead. Or talk Come about on. how goddamn good it is and it, how well it holds up. I mean, it's, I, it's, it's just... It is so goddamn good. I mean, uh... Not a false move. Not no, false no, moment. no. Not a false moment. Not a. Uh, none of the stakes are ever false. Um, the, at Brad Bird is just is so. They're rats, and, and you're rooting for these goddamn rats. And he went out of his way to make them look and act like rats. They, they, they study sound like rats. rats. They, huh? they, they, weren't they oh, studied? Yeah, of the, course the they, animators were studied rats. Yeah. Studied yeah. kitchens. They studied. They went and they built a separate computer program so that the tiles in the kitchen would all be uneven. Because they would go to these great kitchens, all the tiles were uneven, and they made sure that it wasn't this nice grid. They, I had a friend who was a chef. He's like, oh my god, in the background, there's always a pot of uh, potatoes and water, which every restaurant, just they always have potatoes soaking in water, ready to go. That's what restaurants have. It's a great... Like they got all these little... But they're just little throwaway the background details. It's a great movie about creativity. Ab 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 about and, yeah, the, and, and how... And individuality. It, you can't decide where creativity is going to land, and when if it lands someplace weird, help it out. Help it out if it lands someplace weird. It's And yeah. that whole cast, I have to say, and just watching it again last night, Ian Holm and you and Janine oh, Christ. and Brad and Peter O'Toole. They, the animators would have fights. They would draw lots to see who got to animate Peter O'Toole's lines because they played me his dialogue years before they animated it. I spent two years on that. And so when Were you was, always alone, by the way? Because I know Gilbert was in the booth because Gilbert didn't interact with Robin Williams. Yeah. No, I was always oh, alone. I was, most, I, most of... Well, uh, most, I would do it alone. Most voiceover, you are alone. Yeah, yeah. and I, sometimes I would do it with Jonathan Freeman, who was the who was Jafar. Oh, oh, because you're going back and forth. Yeah, and, but even then, when you're with someone, they don't want you overlapping your dialogue. No, and, right. It, no. You're still very much doing it and, by yourself. And that's what always gets me when I hear these stories. Oh God, when. Robin and Gilbert were together in that sound booth. <laughs> that would be, cr and I thought, I never ran into him once no, during no. the making. Yeah, I, I, most most voice. I do a lot of voiceover, and I'm always alone. But I, I heard alone. the Simpsons, or at least they used to do it like an old radio show. They maybe they did at the beginning, but and also the, think of when they were starting out. I mean. Digital technology, recording technology, I, you can record shows anywhere. I, you know, when I, there's a show that I do for sci fi called Happy, 
where I do it over Skype, you know, with direct. So it, it, it's all keeps changing. You can do it so that, you know, and, and I think a good actor can even out of context can figure out where the how the line should be and how it should land. And I had Brad Bird directing me. So it, he really knew exactly what he wanted. He, he had the whole movie in his head and he knew what the other performance would be like and how they'd bounce off of each other. You show a lot of range. I mean, I'm watching the scene last night in the sewer. Oh, when you man. Start, when you're turning the page and, and, and Gusteau is coming alive off of the, off of the cookbook. And, and it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's really. And also the, the scene where um, he uh, uh, is, is kind of breaking off with his family. He thinks it, it's one or the other. And yeah. that's really, really sad. Yeah. Yeah. The world we live in belongs to the enemy. We must live carefully. We look out for our own kind, Remy. When all is said and done, we're all we've got. No. What? No. Dad, I don't believe it. You're telling me that the future is, can only be, more of this? This is the way things are. You can't change nature. Change is nature, Dad. The part that we can influence. And it starts when we decide. Where are you going? With luck, forward. Terrific performance. How did, how did he heard you in a? In a he was a driving in a, around in his car. In his car, they they were having trouble casting the lead. I didn't know they brought me in for the lead. But I was driving around. He was driving around his car. They played a bit of mine from my first album. Where I'm talking about steakhouses. And it's very filthy. Uh, talking about a gravy pipe going up your ass, and it's just all <laughs> this horrible. So he says, but he was like, "That's the voice I right. want." And he did, and I, I've never seen it, but he apparently he said, he said he made a pencil test of Remy doing that routine. And he showed it to the Disney people, and they were like, is he going to curse? Like, I'm like, no, he's not going to. He's going to, it'll be his voice doing the dialogue. And then they brought me in for a couple of reads. And I thought I was just coming in to read for a rat. I did not know I was coming in for the lead. And right. then after a couple weeks, they're like, okay, you're Remy. And I go, and who's Remy? And they're like, the rat that's cooking. I'm like, wait, what? And it was, it went from, you know, I pop up on shows to, I'm going. Oh, you you re you referenced in the book when you went to see Toy Story that you had no idea. You say no twelve idea. years into the future. If I had any idea that I was going to be, no, wouldn't have believed it. Could, in a Pixar also, movie. I was just like I thought Toy Story was this brilliant one-off, and I didn't know that they would build this empire of brilliant films. You know what I mean? Like you see it. And, They're all so good. And Toy Story Two has has the scene that oh, you know the um the John Cusack scene. Oh. God, yeah. I can't even think about that. Me it neither. makes me cry so hard. Yeah, you, you know they're all good. But yeah. I always think like when I did Aladdin, it's like had that been done like maybe a year later, it would have been like uh, Tom Cruise would have been the parrot, <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. Leonardo DiCaprio would be Jafar. Right. Yeah, that, that's the one th thing about really good animation is they don't necessarily go for a, a celebrity because a celebrity voice doesn't really give you any value unless they're good. I'm not saying never use a celebrity. Yeah. It's not like Eddie Murphy is worth his weight in diamonds as a voiceover yes, actor. Yes. My God, he's yeah. amazing. Um, Antonio Banderas is an amazing voiceover actor. But there's other huge stars that they brought in to do voiceover, and it... Uh, and you spent too much money, and, and you didn't. You wanted the name, but then they can't actually sustain a character. And it's like kids watching the movie don't know who they these don't actors care. are. And they can bring in. Look, what's weird is voiceover is very, very just like live acting is. Sometimes a brilliant live actor ends up being a terrible voiceover actor. It has nothing to do with their skill as an actor. It's just a different. I've I, I don't want to name names, but there's been some because I did a lot of punch up on animated movies. And there's been a couple where they brought in some. Pretty big, brilliant actors. And you're like, oh, boy, did you guys waste your money? This person did not deliver. This was not, you know, whereas then there's other times where you're like, again, going back to Eddie Murphy is yeah. just amazing as a voiceover actor. Can't believe he, I can't believe, what has he done? He did Mulan and he did the Shrek movies. Is that it? I that's think, insane. And I, then he did the PJs for Fox. But right, I think that's Why isn't it. he constantly doing voiceover? He's so good. <laughs> Maybe we need an Iago Remy movie. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, in the time we have left, oh, are we done, Mr. Oswalt? Oh. Would you like listeners? To- I'm so sorry you've gone on this journey with us. <laughs> this really this went actually, nowhere, did it? I think this is actually a good show. Oh my god! <laughs> Do you want to talk about? You can talk about. I'm going to give you your choice. You can tell uh, those uh, those funny blade stories. The the stuff about Wesley Snipes is fucking hilarious. I'm going to lay off of those. I, now I feel bad. He was going through such a bad time. Okay, and I'm like, let's not I feel do like, that. I feel like in the future I'm going to be doing some movie where I have some kind of crazy meltdown. There's going to be some guy going just writing it all down. For all I know, he was having a horrible week. Do you want to tell us about... So tell us that one. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, would you like to talk about working with the great Jerry Stiller? Oh, Jesus. Well, I mean, Jerry Stiller was... He was great, although sometimes... And I don't think he meant to do this, but his his way of reading lines was so inherently funny that sometimes he would get a laugh on lines that he kind of needed to not get a laugh on because it would hurt the joke after it. Like, the way he would come in and go, hello, children, but it was always so weird, that would get a laugh. He'd be like, no, that's to just set the scene. Yeah. <laughs> yes. like, he would get a laugh, because and he did, he, did a, he did a read one time on a line about, he was with a bunch of, he goes, I, I remember I was hanging out with a bunch of bikers in the 60s, but that didn't, it was, it, it, the line was, but that didn't last long because they treated me very badly. But the way he read it, he goes, but that didn't last long because they treated me very badly. Like, like <laughs> he, he like put his head back and you see him live this whole, which is, and it was so disturbing that they went, let's do that again. And don't take that because that pause made the line not funny. It made it creepy. It made it, it was hilarious to me. But the audience was like, I, oh, wait, wait a minute. What is he referencing? So it was just that weird. And then he also just like, he was in so many movies that I loved, you know, like, you know, uh, was was he was in Lovers and Other Strangers? Yeah, he's got a part. Yeah. He's in Taking a Pelham Taking 1, 2, a Pelham, which all of his dialogue he improvised. Oh, man. none I didn't of that know was that. in the script. Yeah, that's cool. And and the reason he improvised it, he says, because one time he blew a line. It's when Matthew comes in and goes, "This is Rico Patron on the weekends. He works for the mafia." Uh, Rico, tell these gentlemen the exciting things that are happening in the Transit Authority. And then he kind of looked up at it from his. He goes, uh, uh, he goes. Well, last week on the Ninth Street Station, we thought we had a bomb. It turned out to be a cantaloupe. <laughs> and and then he goes, all right, thanks, Rico. And then he just walks away, and that was all. And then the director was like, say whatever the hell you want. Yeah. So then he just kept riffing that whole thing about even great men have to pee. I like how you said you learned to act on that show because you kept waiting uh, to get the axe. Oh, my God. Well, the first two seasons, I was so bad. I was so bad. And the two things that saved me were I really started honing in on Kevin James, who is a brilliant TV actor. And I don't say that to diminish him. Mm-hmm. T- especially sitcom acting is so fucking hard to do because it's so unnatural it's hard to make it seem natural and he could he had that jackie gleason danny devito kind of thing where he could make it you know make bigness seem like very real yeah and so i had that going for me and then i also had i had this amazing weed connection this i had this (laughs) guy um i was friends with this guy that that grew this legendary weed out in the midwest and he had moved to la and um one of the show creators was a huge pothead and i would bring this weed in I would always bring him a little bit of the weed and he was like oh I you know so I, I feel like partially he kept me around because I had this really good weed and it gave me the time to learn how to act before I jump off voiceovers because mm-hmm. I just wanted to go back to it because there was something I lost on one of my cards this is kind of interesting you both played DC Comics villains in Did voiceover we? you played the toy maker yes in a Batman cartoon mm-hmm. and Gilbert I was okay I was two you were two yeah in the Superboy series. Let me guess, uh, Mr. Mixelplex. How'd you know? I played Mr. I just <laughs> had to be. That voice, come I had, on. I've been that in a bunch of uh, No Superman kidding. Tim Daly, the Tim Daly Superman. Yeah, the yeah. Tim Daly one. And I was also in the uh, Superboy series. I did two episodes where I was knick-knack, Master of Toys. What? Yeah. So you both played evil toy makers. Oh my yes. God! On uh, DC Comics properties. Yes. Well, I played the toy. What did I play again? I'm so. Oh my God. Toy maker. Toy maker. But then I also, in a college humor short, I played the penguin. Did you? In a live action short, I played the penguin, and it was this really cool series called Bad Man, and it's um, uh, uh, oh my, why am I blanking on his name? Pete Holmes. <laughs> played Batman, but Batman Dave's is basically like, out. yeah, basically he's basically like like brain damage. He's like the dumbest human being on the planet. 
but he does that voice. Oh my God, I'm so you know, he does the the uh, uh, Christian Bale voice, and and they do, and and I would say like like a Christopher Nolan version of what the Penguin would look like if he had used him in the movie. So it's a funny scene, but the makeup is so like. Holy shit, someone should actually do this. Oh, wow. It's really cool. You can look it up online. It's a very funny sketch. I, when we, one of my my happiest moments, we had on Adam West. Yes. Oh, man. Adam on the podcast. And he said to me, he goes, you know, <laughs> you would have made a great penguin. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought, wow. And maybe a great Riddler. Yeah. Maybe a great Riddler. Well, there's a yeah. rumor. A very you know, strange Riddler. Um. Harlan Ellison pitched an outline for an episode of Batman that would have had Two-Face in it. Yes. But it was apparently, they thought it was too gruesome and they didn't do it. And the rumor was they were going to, at the time, a very young Clint Eastwood was going to play Two-Face. Was going to play Harvey Dent. Yeah. That was the rumor. Do you know so, Harlan? Yes. Yeah. Isn't I'm going to go visit him next week. Isn't he interesting? How's he doing? Uh, he, his his mind is so goddamn sharp. He's his, you know, He's doing some physical therapy. His body's... And a frail, but he he just does not lose a goddamn beat, yeah. and it's I think it's just from pure orneriness. He just stays sharp because he's, he's so angry all he's the time. He's the best, was but a, he's so hilarious. Well, I asked for selfish reasons because we thought about having him on here. Oh boy, that'd be great yeah. to talk to him. I mean, the god, the stories that guy has. Yes. Well, and he was also a crooner. He was the lounge singer. Yes, Did I know he was a trumpet player. I didn't yeah. know he sang. He sang. He'll tell you about it. I know he used to also ghostwrite stuff for Lenny Bruce. Back I knew in that the day. Too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We should get Harlan Ellison on here. Oh, yeah. Fine. One of the on great the phone. One of the great storytellers. Oh. He, this, one of the guys we'll who told me so many stories, but he did a, when he wrote City on the Edge of Forever for um, uh, Star, Star Trek, Trek, he had to get approval, script approval from William Shatner. And he, he claims William Shatner rode over to his house on a motorcycle, <laughs> parked in the driveway, read the script in the driveway, but counted that he had more lines than Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> Done. Great. <laughs> Got his motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes, if if that is, A, I don't even think that's true. A, I want it to be true. And if it is true, it makes me love him even more. Yes. I, I spent a so Thanksgiving with Harlan Ellison and Len Wein. Oh, which was no, really? The late, great Len Wein. At yeah. Ellison in Wonderland or at Len's house? No, at house? Len's house. I'll tell you about oh. it. I'll tell you about it. When have you been like, to Ellison in Wonderland? I have not had the pleasure. With the, with the secret rooms and the hidden passageways. Oh, my God, the, the weird, yeah. The, I never the, had the I moved, tower. I moved the, out of L.A. Yeah. The, but the, I love um, the guy. Mick Jagger used to crash there. I know. Back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Uh, and uh, they, oh, you guys will love this. There's a there's a Bill Rossler softcore nudie flick called The Godson. Uh, with Ushi Degard, one of my favorite Russ Meyer actresses, that was shot almost entirely inside Ellis in Wonderland back in the 60s. No shit. So if you want to see what his house looks like, go watch The Godson by William Rostler. I'm writing all this down. Yeah, and 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 um, and you have to and, see Larry and, Cohen's bone. And and goddamn Harlan Ellison gets to bury his face between Ushi Degard's breasts. I remember, for which I will forever hate him. <laughs> I remember asking him why he wanted to write for The Flying Nun back in the day. And he said, well, obviously I wanted to fuck Sally Field. It's <laughs> <laughs> <That's> good as <laughs> it's just yeah. the right answer. Yeah, you have to. Uh, and it's getting late, and Dave's here. All right. You're wonderful. Do you, do you want to quickly tell the, the Day of the Clown Tried story? Because I know Gilbert will appreciate it. Oh, God. Okay, very, very quickly. I came in <laughs> possession of, a, of this shooting script for the Day of the Clown Cried, which I sat down and read the script. This is way back in the 95, 96. And it's a goddamn bonkers script because it was Joan O'Brien um, and someone Denton. Oh, yes. And um, they wrote a very serious script, and then he kind of, you can see where he swooped in and did his comedy pass, like the scene where he's pissing ice, mm -hmm. literally pissing ice. So I boiled it down to, like, the scenes that really worked, and I would do these invite-only stage readings of it with, like, David Cross and, uh, I, you know, um, uh, John Glazer, uh, Stephen Colbert narrated at one time. Um, we did them in New York and L.A., and then I got busted because the the LA Weekly caught wind of it and did a whole like pick of the week, mm -hmm. you know, the day the clown cried, and then we were we were served with cease and desist papers at this theater we were going to do it at in Santa Monica. I thought they were from Jerry Lewis, but it turns out it's from this producer who had the right to the original script, <laughs> who wanted to do it, and at the time he was like, "I have got, um, I'm not going to let a bunch of goddamn nobodies." Read this thing in some shit ass theater in Santa Monica. I've got Chevy Chase interested in this, and 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 that night, you know, um, he was screaming at me, and then I told, and 
Bob Odenkirk was in the cast. And then so we did a whole show about <laughs> being shut down. And Bob and Dave did a sketch about the guy finding out about it. And my favorite line was, Chevy Chase was born to play a clown who marches children into an oven. <laughs> and we are not going to let... It was like so goddamn hilarious. So yeah, it just all... So it had all these like, you know, it was just... I don't know. It was one of those very surreal. And then you got to meet Jerry for that. Well, yeah. While briefly. I was doing these, the, the the year that Henny Youngman died, they brought in um, Jerry Lewis wanted to bring in all these young comedians to go up and read one of Henny Youngman's jokes, like in a line, like oh boom, yes, almost, yes, as a tribute. Which I was, I I love Henny Youngman. I oh, have, have, you, too. have you listened to one of his albums recently? I'd forgotten how fast the pace on it, it is a machine gun. Of I, jokes. I, I remember. It, there's I, no breathing room. I once went out to lunch with Henny Youngman. Really? And it was great because he, that's who he was. But it's such a, people keep forgetting, like they, they hear his his jokes isolated. Yeah. And they go, okay, that's a funny joke. I don't see yeah. why this guy. But it's not the, it's the pacing is so relentless that after a while you can't keep up. With the it, it's like it's like the death by a thousand cuts, mm-hmm. where after a while it just becomes almost excruciating how funny it is because it's these little laughs that just keep building and building. And it's amazing to listen to. So, um, and they were trying this out, and then they ended up cutting the sketch. And Jerry's sitting there and is always wearing shorts, always <laughs> wearing shorts, and his and his zip up jacket. But he but on his desk he had that. The rumor was he had that big silver briefcase, the bulletproof briefcase that that had the reels. For the day the clown cried in it. That was the room that he would always carry it around. And I'm like, I should fucking grab that and just run. I should <laughs> yes. grab it and run. And then I will be chased around the city. There'll be helicopters. But I'm like, if I could just get this through a thing, I could transfer it to videotape yes. and just get it out there virally. Like I'd be I'd I'd be in jail, but I would be this weird <laughs> fuck hero. Worth it. Yeah, worth it. yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a noir film where I have the day the clown cried and the city's trying to get me. Well, wasn't the wasn't the rumor that he would go into a room with a suitcase and he would with a hit, tape recorder. and he would secretly record conversations? He would he would pretend oh, to leave it in the Jesus room, Jesus Christ, so they, that he would record they, what they people said about a, him when he left. Yeah, they even made a Seinfeld episode. Yeah, based that was on the that. rumor. Really, he would leave it and then come back for it and say, but "Oh, I left my suitcase," but it was recording what people about said it about is, him. When you think about it, at first you go, "Oh God, what an asshole!" And then you think. God, what are people saying about <laughs> it's a really It's an ingenious idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, I heard that Brian uh, Grazier, I don't know if this is true. And I, I, this is another thing that I, I, I've heard. I've actually heard this confirmed, which makes me love him. He apparently, when he goes and gets invited to someone's party, he'll have hidden in his pocket a little framed photo of himself, a rose and a couple of candles. And he'll go into one of the other rooms when no one's looking, and he'll set up this little, like, altar to himself. And, lay, and then people are all like, why do they have a... Candles and a flower in front of a picture of Brian, like, which I think is the funniest thing I've ever heard. Again, I want it to be true, and, and I also want to steal that. Like, go to a friend's house and then just later on they're like, yes. why do we, wait, is there an altar to Patton? What is it? Like, <laughs> oh, funny man. idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And before we jump, I, I just, I want to mention that you also like the documentary. You tweeted about it. Oh, my God. I That documentary. So we give Neil Berkeley his props. Is so... Because they, they, it's structured so brilliantly where you open up on the life of Gilbert Gottfried and they show him doing sketches and stand-up and, oh, my God, he's such a weirdo. And then you reveal the wife who's so sweet. It, it, like, it's, it, it's, the, it's the opposite of, like, the monster reveal. The, it's, 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 the, it's the shark in Jaws coming out of the water. But what the shark is is a quiet, normal life. And it's the last thing you expect to see coming in this documentary, and it's genuinely shocking. Like, oh wait, his wife and kids are awesome. Wait a minute, what the fuck was that first ten minutes? I thought <laughs> yes. I, I literally thought he lived. Well, you're I in thought there he lived in a bus station or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You We're, show up in there yeah, for yeah. a second, but yeah. like, but yeah. the way the the opening is structured is so brilliant. Yeah, because you just don't see that coming. Yeah, and and it's funny because I didn't want to do it at all, and but boy, what uh, yeah, Neil Berkeley. Yeah, yeah, I have to give Anyway, it's called Gilbert. Yeah. It's so good. Why The first 15 minutes are structured so brilliantly. Great reveal of your delightful, normal life with your beautiful <laughs> apartment. Really well. Again, I thought it would be one. Actually, you know what? And I mean this in, in as respectfully. I thought you'd be living one of those classic Manhattan um, uh, kind of misanthrope 
small apartment, like crammed with. Oh yes. You know, because you see guys like that, like like sure. like like Ratso Sloman, people <laughs> oh, like yes, that, that have yes. that great, you know, like, like Joe Franklin's office. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yes. like a weird like Rat Pack kind of thing. Which, but there's something kind of beautiful about that too. I'm like, yeah, that's obviously that's how he lives. And like, oh my god, that. That is the most beautiful apartment I've ever had. What a wonderful life he's living. He doesn't deserve you either. You have your nice, comfortable robe. I'm like, how the, f- you know, it's so great. And then and then you de- you brought back down to earth watching him wash his socks in a hotel sink. And then, yeah. And then also when they, oh, uh, well, you're brought back down to earth when he drags out from under his bed the gigantic oh, yes. um, post-apocalyptic Tupperware that's things full of, yes. full of uh, soaps, soaps and shampoos. conditioners, skin lotions. <laughs> <laughs> that is the that is the mo- and that's the scene like in the '90s serial killer movie when they they like the person realizes her husband's nuts when she finds the weird scrapbook or the weird box. Oh like, yes! Oh my god, he collects yeah. children's shoes. You know, like that kind of. <laughs> which that was a weird trope of the in the Played '90s. They Rails always back. had I called it the hanging scrapbook where the the killer would keep a shoebox or a scrapbook full of incriminating yes! clippings and photographs. <laughs> yes. that, but like out just like I hope no one opens this drawer and right. finds enough stuff to put well, me in the seven, gas chamber. I think they go in they go in the apartment in seven. But, but they, everything's all but, over the but walls. They, but they do that almost as it like I'm talking about in movies like Misery and Single White Female and Fatal Attraction. There are these like. Things of like, hey, I hope no one opens that up and sees that I'm a massive criminal. But yeah, they would have these movies where the walls were completely covered. Yes. Yeah, Yeah, we're like, if anyone comes in here, you know you're going to jail. Yes. Yeah, so. My favorite moment in the movie is, is Bill Burr. Saying he's what the fuck is he riding the bus? <laughs> Do you think anybody's gonna? Is he, if somebody's gonna, is this somebody gonna see him and go? Is it Gilbert Gottfried? And at that moment, Neil cuts to this black woman doing a complete three eighty. She goes, "Is that Gilbert?" <laughs> so wonderful. Yeah. Well, this, guys, this was fun, I'm so sir. Glad I got to do this. And this is what's so insane about this is this is the first time we've met. The first time I've ever gotten to meet you. Yeah. And I've heard so many, literally what I was- Is that true? Oh, first yeah. time ever. Unbelievable. And and yes, I'm taking a picture possible? and I'm saying, think of how my day started. This is how it ended. I'm going to put that on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how is, is it how my possible? Day You're such fans of, of one I'd, another. Yeah. You know, it's Just, weird. Well, because you work, when you get to a certain level in comedy, and this isn't a brag, you don't get to see your friends as much. Because because you're now you're working you're not doing the hang no. where you're all hanging out like you know there was time where I I would see Blaine Capatch and Brian Posehn and Greg Barron every day of my life because we had all day and then when you start getting busy and working I don't get to see Brian that much yeah. and we're still like best friends but and I'm, I'm I'm not upset I'm happy he's working yeah I don't want us to be hanging out for five hours a day because that means something's gone horribly wrong in our lives well but, so yeah. the next time Gilbert's in L A. Yes. Yes, you have one of two invitations. You can drive down to uh, San Diego because Tippi Hedren invited us to come to the oh, to the to the, lion. to the Lion Reserve. Oh, Fucking really? Lion. Yes, you can go. You can take them up on that. And a little more down scale, you can go to Bob Burns' house. And I've look, already been. Okay. Yeah, I, I would go to. I live like three I've blocks from him, and I would, I would go to his. House. I would go to his Halloween um, parties. Oh, you went to those? Yeah. Any of the best? I have an invitation to go to Guillermo del Toro's house. Oh. Which is, I don't know if you've seen pictures of the interior. No. Oh, Gilbert, go look up, right, Guillermo del Toro's house and look how he decorates the inside of his house. You'll lose your mind. And, and. It, it, I, it's, it's, it's the stuff you love. I, I, I did like a weekend at a club in Pittsburgh and I was bored out of my wits during the day, as you always are, mm-hmm. right? This, and and uh, what's his name? Savini. Savini. Yeah. Tom Savini. No lives shit. There. Invited and him after the fact. He's got a big house with all this monster stuff. I got to tour Rick Baker's house, and I have an open invitation. Oh my god! Rick Baker his lives. basement alone is insane. Is he in LA? Oh my god! Right, he's right into Luca Lake. You guys will have to do. When you guys come out, let me know. I will. I Rick will love to have you over. Oh, I. And he love- is a fast. He. Worked on Star Wars for God's sake. He did the cantina scene, and he has all the original masks on the wall. And then we can we go to Rosenthal's house for the pizza? Oh, absolutely! Every okay. Sunday, are you kidding? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll then, bring you over there. I'm that. in. He actually created a lot of the stuff that was in the Howling. Oh, I mean, he not only did he create; it wasn't even that he created makeups. He created techniques and 
um, uh, bits of hardware that are now just standard issue that he had to build from the ground up. They didn't exist until he built them. Quite brilliant. He's he's a genius. And there's a movie that he did the uh, makeup for where if when you watch it now, you think. If someone said this guy's going to be a legendary makeup artist, right, right, you'd go go fuck yourself. <laughs> and uh, Octo Man, he did Octo Man. Yes, Is that a Corman thing. Yeah, he's well, he half did... octopus, <laughs> half man. I need to look because I thought one of his early ones was just one they did on Mystery Science Theater called Squirm. Oh, that's and I the think Jeff did, Lieberman movie. With the, yeah, with the, yeah, worms. the worms. This guy has like, look, look, at, look at worm face or yeah. some weird kind of. Yeah. yeah but, but he's he, a genius. He is a, he's a oh, genius. brilliant. My brilliant. God, yeah. I mean, the, the stuff, and now, the stuff, is he retired now? I think he's retired, but he does like, I mean, he does lectures and yeah. books. But oh, his, okay. you know, he he's, he, of course he's retired. He's There's nothing left for him to invent at this yeah. point, you know. And, but, but the one good thing okay. that's weird is now that he's retired, there's a generation of filmmakers coming up that have kind of rejected CGI and are trying to go back to practical effects because oh, that's interesting. because CGI just doesn't stun anyone anymore. They're just like, well, yeah, it's fake. That's but if you can find a way to do it practically, it freaks people out. Let this man go home. He's got to get up at 7 o'clock and be on television. Oh, yeah, I got to go. Yeah. Oh. So, but. All right, field LA, trip in L.A. Let me, yeah, if you're coming, let me know. Oh, I, I want to wa- I want to watch you react to Rick Baker's house. That would be fascinating. And his every year for his Halloween cards, the makeup he does for his family. And oh his wow! Is insane. I'll bet. And what the thing? Just one more thing with computerization. I think Roger Ebert said, um, "A computer, uh, you know, CGI uh, looks real but feels fake." Uh, stop action. Yes. Looks fake, but feels real. Because there's a sense of wonder and magic yes. to it that, that you connect with. Whereas all you can, the, the most you can do with CGI is just, is go, well, that's technically very solid. Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't thrill no you. Yeah. Be- because I think with stop motion, like Jesus, he had to do that with clay. How did they pull that off? Yeah. The guy fighting five different skeletons and, and then you, your brain goes, they had to coordinate that actor. Yeah. Then they had to make sure Insane. to get the. It, it's it's incredible. Exhausting. So Thanks I, for doing I, this, man. I'm being great told to, have you. to wrap up. <laughs> Only about forty minutes ago. Yes. Wow. Well, well, why right. split hairs? So this has been Gilbert and Frank's. Nope. Um, it's the other show. Oh, this. <laughs> well. Oh, wow. Yes. You're consistent. Oh my God. This <laughs> has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. And we've been talking to a man who's going to go home, have sex with his wife, <laughs> and imagine that I'm oh. fucking him in the ass oh, God. like he's Ned Beatty. Ma- Meredith, <laughs> oh my God. please, if, if Meredith Salinger is listening to this, please, I, I'm going to make sure she does not listen to this podcast. <laughs> Pat <laughs> Oswalt. <Pat and> <laughs> we'll see you in LA. Thank you, guys.